Bless us as we share communion around your table and help us to serve you in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning will be 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1 to 8. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instruct you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable not in passionate lust for the pagans who do not know God. And in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such, sin, such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Oh, good morning. And uh, Jan sends her regrets this morning that she's not here. And uh, she has that cold that's going around with all the hacking and the coughing and the coughing up the ugly stuff, you know, and not sleeping at night. And uh, so she thought that... Uh, it was better to uh, remain home than have one of those coughing fits in the middle of service or spreading it around to the folks who are here. So uh, she says hi this morning. I'm continuing Pastor Paul's uh, preaching series on the Ten Commandments, and today we have the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, he was joking last week that I drew the short straw <laughs> on this one. And, uh, you know, this is where you pray for, like, absolutely full church, because that way, when you're looking around, no one person thinks you're preaching to them, right? And, uh, but uh, that's okay. Uh, you know, this passage, uh, Thou shalt not commit uh, adultery, is pretty clear cut, but to illuminate things, we're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning, and Patrick read for us. And to provide a little historical background, as we're looking at it, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica, and uh, in its day, it was the capital and the largest city of the region of Macedonia. We have a map there, you can see where it is in uh, what is currently the country of Greece, and it's called Thessaloniki now. And I went looking for all sorts of different pictures, and there's not a lot of pictures of the ancient stuff in uh, Thessaloniki, uh, because uh, it's, uh, the city has, city has stayed in one spot, and uh, they've just kept building upward, and so a lot of the stuff is covered. But in its day, uh, as it continues to be, uh, it was a very important city. It's a seaport on the Aegean Sea. It's located at the intersection of two major land routes. One goes west to Italy, and the other goes to the Danube. And, of course, the famous river which goes all the way to Germany. So an important trade route was located there, and it's still an important center. It's the second largest city in modern-day Greece. Now, something that we should understand about uh, Thessalonica or any Roman city that we find in the New Testament is that the people in Thessalonica lived in a world where people did not see sex outside of marriage as anything unusual. They didn't see it as sin, but rather it was a part of their normal lives. And as that sinks in, think about this, that anything and everything was available in the city. And sex was even a big part of many religions of the day. Now, I did find some pictures of the city. And uh, here we've got two pictures, They're actually two pictures of the same market area, just from different directions. Uh, there was a, a bus station there, in the 60s it moved and when they began excavations to do uh, some other work they found remnants of this market so as part of all this market there was a conservatory an amphitheater that you'll see there was a mint for making coins and there was also a house of prostitution which was probably linked to uh, some of the worship that happened there now one of the reasons that Paul wrote was because of the constant pressure on newly converted Christians to revert to the easygoing sexual standards of the city and as we understand that, it shouldn't be hard for us to see the parallels between the world of Paul's day and the world that we live in. 
Of course, we all know that the world that we live in, it's possible to, to indulge every curiosity at the click of a mouse. And the world that we live in, the biblical standard of sexual activity only within the context of marriage between a man and a woman is often openly mocked. And so this passage has something relevant to say to us as 21st century Christians. Now, I came across an interesting quote from a biblical commentator, his name is William Neal, and this is what he said. He said, in our own semi-pagan society, it needs to be stated again as firmly as Paul does here. Any guesses of what, when he wrote that? 1955. <laughs> okay. So if he felt that in 1955, 60 years ago, how much more so now? Just as Paul helped the first century Christians in ancient Greece, Paul can help us to live a holy life, to live a life which is pleasing to God. And in fact, that's what we're going to see in 1 Thessalonians. It's what we see in verses 1 and 2, where Paul writes, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. And he compliments them, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. So how is it that we can live to please God? How can we live to please God more and more and this is what we're going to see in our passage this morning. We're going to see that we need, first of all, to focus on the higher goal. Second, that we're going to need to decide not to sin. And finally, we're going to learn that we can take control of our own bodies in these matters. And plus, I'm going to throw in some pointers along the way for maintaining sexual integrity. So as we begin this morning and we uh, turn to verse 3, we see that we need to focus on the higher goal. And in verse 3 we read, it is God's will that you, should be, <clears throat> that you should be sanctified. I love how Paul approaches us in, with this. He doesn't uh, a wag a finger. He knows what all the temptations are, but he doesn't berate them. Rather, he elevates the topic to the highest plane. He says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. He points them to the big goal, to understand what God's will is and how they can fit into it. Now we understand that uh, if we have a big goal that we want to accomplish, we can't focus on how hard that is. We can't focus on what we're leaving behind, but rather we have to focus on what's ahead. So if we want to lose weight, we can't focus on the food. We can't focus on how hungry we are. We can't focus on how hard the exercise is, but rather we need to focus on what we'll gain if we persevere. How much better we'll feel, a lower blood pressure, more energy, new clothes, right? extended lifespan. Uh, if we're going to succeed, then we need to keep those higher goals in mind. Uh, Jan did this one time to me when we were in university about my study habits. Okay, so I'm walking her home one night before we were married and I was explaining to her this great philosophy of study that I had that a B is a good mark, so why work any harder to get an A? Sounded good to me. And uh, she turned to me and she has no memory of this other than me telling the story hundreds of times. Uh, that uh, she turned to me and she said, you mean God doesn't deserve your best? And there is no argument against that, right? <laughs> and, uh, and actually, uh, I think uh, she was God-led in that because uh, when I started working for A's, I got A's and I actually won some awards and I helped pay for my Master of Divinity to become a minister. So, you know, uh, yeah. But, you know, that's what Paul's doing here is he calls us to consider God's higher, God's will. He says it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, when we talk about God's will, we talk about God's will in two ways. Uh, there's God's specific will. That's usually what we talk about when we're talking about God's will. So, you know, when we're younger, you know, what does God want me to do with my life? So vocationally, it was a job. And as we get older, who should I marry? Uh, you know, should I buy a house, what kind, of buy, what kind of house and where, or should I keep this job, change jobs? That's God's specific will, and that can change to, uh, from person to person. But what we're talking about in this passage is God's general will. And this is what's true for you and me, and uh, true for all believers down through all the ages in every time and place. We're talking about God's general will in this, and what's true for all believers. Now, it can be really quite a long process to sometimes to discern what God's specific will is for my life. But thankfully, we don't have to work very hard to understand God's general will because Paul uh, here and uh, we have writing in other places spells out very clearly what God's will for us 
for all of us. He says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. God wants every believer in every age, in every time and place to be sanctified. Now, what does it mean to be sanctified? I'm glad you asked. Okay? It comes from a Greek word which literally means to make holy. In English, the word sanctify comes from the Latin word sanctus. And again, that's holy, right? And uh, to be sanctified is to be set apart for holy use. Now, I look down at our communion set here this morning. We're going to have communion in just a few moments. And uh, we use special dishes for communion. They're special, and we use them only for communion. We would never uh, think of taking the plate and using it as a Frisbee, for instance. Right? That would just be... That would just not be right. I mean, we understand it's a plate, but we've set it apart for a special use. You know, as Christians, God wants us to be sanctified, to be set apart for him. And that's the higher goal that Paul wants us to see. You know, after receiving Christ, we could perhaps continue to live any old way we want, but we'll be living far short of what God has for us far short of what God calls us to. And being sanctified, what we're doing is we're setting ourselves apart for him in order to fulfill that higher purpose in our lives. In the same way, we'd never think of using the communion plate to, to play Frisbee. There are some thoughts and attitudes and actions which fall far short of what God intends for us. And it's very important for us to understand this about our Christian life. God calls us to sanctification. That is, like more and more, we devote ourselves wholly and completely to serve God. To be completely sanctified is to live single-mindedly, single-mindedly in devotion to God. That we're not hot and cold, we're not on and off, but we have a single-minded single devotion and dedication. Uh, this is Usain Bolt. Uh, you'll know him from the Olympics. He's from Jamaica. And he's considered to be the fastest person ever. Uh, he holds the world record in the 100 meters right now at 9.58 seconds, which is pretty fast, I have to say. He also holds the 200 meter record, which makes him very unusual. Usually specialize in one or the other. He holds the records in both, and he's the first man to hold both records. Uh, he led the Jamaican team to set the world record in the 4x100 meter relay. And he's the reigning Olympic champion in all three of those events, in the relay, the 100 and 200, the first man to win six Olympic gold medals in sprinting, and he's an 11-time world champion. Now, when Usain Bolt steps into the starting blocks, he's already focusing on the finish line. He's already looking down. He, as he gets in the blocks, he's placing his feet just so, he's digging them in, he's putting his hands on the ground just so, he's preparing his legs. He's controlling his breathing. He's picturing how he's going to come out of the blocks and how he's going to take those first, those first steps. He also knows exactly how many steps he's going to take and how many breaths. He'll pump his arms and he'll dig for every single millimeter of that track. He'll never take his eyes off the line at the end and he won't even turn his head to the left or to the right. Now, that's a great example of single-minded devotion. When we do that toward God, that's what sanctification is. And that's what God calls us to as Christians, to be sanctified. Now, does it happen overnight? Of course not. Sanctification is a process of becoming more like God, becoming more holy. Uh, will we ever be fully and completely sanctified? Probably not. In this life. But let us not use these as excuses. God calls us to something higher, and he calls us to be sanctified, to be set, to, set apart in devotion to him. This is our higher goal, and this is our starting point as we look at this whole area of the Christian's attitude towards sexual sin. So we need to look to the higher goal. Secondly, we need to decide not to sin. We see this in verse 3. Paul writes, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now, before we go any further, we need to understand what Paul says here, when, uh, what he means when he says avoid, because it means something a little differently from what we mean when we think we're avoiding something. So when we think about uh, avoiding, we think 
try not to, but don't worry too much about it. It's kind of like when we're driving down the road, road in the spring, you know, and、uh, we try to avoid the potholes, right? And so,、uh, as we're driving along, but okay, we avoid the potholes, but、eh, you know, if we hit one, it's no big deal. Okay, that's not what Paul has in mind here. It's not like avoiding potholes. It's more like avoiding household chores. Okay, you know where we'll do anything to get out of doing those, right? A little humor in there.、Uh, need a little humor when you got a topic as serious as this is, right? You know, it's like a teenager avoiding household chores. They'll do anything to make themselves scarce to get out of there. They'll prevent themselves from taking part. That's Paul's idea in all this. Paul says to us to avoid sexual immorality, and we understand that this isn't a wish; that this is in the strongest possible sense of avoiding something. Literally, he's told, he's telling us to hold ourselves back from participating in this, to prevent ourselves.、Uh, the Old King James Version says, "Abstain." From sexual immorality, abstains one of those words that sounds so old-fashioned now, but、uh, but that's really the sense of it all: abstaining of of avoiding it completely. It's an active verb. It's something we need to do with intention. We need to decide that we're going to make it not happen. And this leads me to the point of the section that we need to decide not to sin. Now let me see if this rings true in your experience, because it's what I've observed over the years. Most people don't have affairs because they didn't decide. Well, most people have affairs. Who?、Uh, let me. Most people who have affairs. There we go. Didn't decide to have affairs. They didn't get up one morning and say, you know, I think I'm going to fool around with my wife. Okay, that's not how people fall into affairs usually. No one at you know, New Year's made a resolution. This year, I'm going to have an affair. I mean, that's just not the way that it happens.、Uh, people have affairs because they、uh, they just no one decided not to have an affair. See the difference in that? Okay, they just didn't decide not to, and so and it's the same with the.、Uh, With premarital sex and with pornography or any other kind of sexual immorality, it happens because no one decided it would not happen. But you know, when you and I hear those stories, it sounds like it was just like a car accident. You know, how did it happen? Well, it just happened. You've heard that. I've heard that. But to say that sexual immorality just happened, it's like driving a car off a bridge. And saying you didn't see the six signs that you ran over to do it, right? Okay. So sexual immorality doesn't just happen. It happens because someone decided, or someone. I, I'm getting this all. This, there were all these did and didn't, 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 didn't. You understand what I'm saying here, right?、It、happens because no one decided to make sure it didn't happen. They didn't decide not to sin. As Christians, we need to be intentional about keeping ourselves from sin if we want to reach that higher goal of being holy, of being set apart for God's purposes. Sexual integrity doesn't just happen. We need to be intentional. We need to decide that we are not going to sin. And if we do that, if we decide we are not going to sin, then we begin to order our lives a little bit differently, so that we don't fall into sexual immorality. If we decide that we're not going to sin, we choose movies differently. We use our computers differently. We handle our relationships differently. All because we decided not to sin.、So、we need to decide not to sin. That's our second point this morning. Our third one this morning comes from verses four and five. We understand from verses four and five that we can take control of these matters. Paul tells us each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, and not in passionate lust. Verses four and five. We could、uh, go on and and、uh, unpack all of verses four to eight. We're only going to get to the end, get to the end of this section this morning. There's a lot in all this, and、uh, as Christians, we understand from this as we read verses four and five. 
that we can control ourselves in these things. As Christians, we always face an, face an important decision. We can be led around by our urges and desires of our bodies, or we can actually take control of our own lives. In fact, I think we can go so far to say that until we take control and learn to control our bodies, that we're just simply slaves led around by those same impulses and urges. As Christians, we need to take control of our own bodies if we're to seek, and again, this is the higher goal, if we're to seek holiness and we're to be sanctified, set apart for God's purposes. Uh, last week, Jan and I went to the rodeo, uh, the, Wheat King, or the, the Wheat City Stampede, there we go. Had a great time. Uh, there were a couple events that were the most fascinating to me. I grew up out east, you know, we saw rodeo on TV, but it's so much more exciting to be there, right, in person. And uh, to uh, see the sights and the smell, the smells, and, uh, you know, just to be there. Uh, half, uh, <laughs> I almost said half curting. There we go. Calf herding. I was telling someone earlier that you never know what's going to come out when I preach. And I just pray that I'm going to say something that's not going to get me, in, that I'm not going to say something that's going to get me in trouble along the way. And uh, with this passage, you always want to be careful that you pronounce all the words carefully, like, that you don't actually say, you know, sexual morality, okay, as opposed to immorality, but anyway. And here I almost said uh, uh, half curting. There we go. <laughs> but first was the calf herding. So working in pairs uh, on horses, they have to sort ten, uh, 10 calves and direct them one at a time from one pen to another. This is probably not news to some of you, right? But uh, this was new to me. I'd not, never, never seen this before. It was fascinating. Uh, barrel racing. I'd seen that before. But to watch uh, the ladies do this on their horses, see the control and the speed they have as they whip around the barrels, incredible. Truly an amazing skill. Uh, it was amazing to me to see the kind of control they have over their horses. That they could command them to go forward or backward, sideways. They could turn them a little or a lot. They could... Uh, go fast or slow, and, uh, and it didn't look to me like they were doing anything, that the horse just, you know, it's like this weird mind thing going on or something, right? Uh, but there are subtle little things that the horse picks up through the rider's body and through the reins and all that. I, I could see all that. You know, I understand that horses aren't this way naturally, that it takes a lot of training to get a horse to that point. And in fact, uh, horses are really very headstrong and stubborn, from what I understand. Not unlike some people I know, but... Uh, and and they, they like to push their limits to see what they can get away with. And the challenge of the rider is always to keep that horse under control. And the horse can tell the difference between a strong rider and a weak rider, and they'll take full advantage of that. Again, this is probably not news to you, but my relatives farm cows, okay? You don't ride cows. <laughs> Okay, well, anyway, that's another story, okay? I don't know a lot about horses, but I know it takes a lot of training, but it is possible to do. And in fact, there's a lot of money in training horses to take them from that raw product and to create, uh, to, to train them to be able to do this. You know, until we take control of our own bodies and turn them toward holy purposes, we're like those untrained horses that we're just going to follow our wants and our urges. And we're not going to do anything different from any of the non-believers to do exactly the same thing. But the good news in all this is that we can take control. And we've already seen the first step. And the first step is that we decide not to sin. There are some other things that we can do to take control over our own bodies. And probably this is a good point to insert in all this in the discussion, that uh, we need to understand that sex is good. Sex is not bad. That God created it. Uh, have some of you taken an Alpha course before and you've heard Nicky Gumbel talk about this a little bit? I love the way that he would explain this. God is not up in heaven looking down at us saying, oh my goodness, what are they doing now? You know, that's not... You know, God created this. Sex is good. It's not bad. And it's important to understand there are a lot of marriages that have faced difficulty because uh, some, one of the partners thought that sex was bad. And that's not the case at all. God designed sex, though, but within a proper context of within marriage between a man and a woman. We need to understand that. Uh, we need to understand when we are most vulnerable to temptation. 
And again, this can help us as we uh, work in this whole area of sexual integrity. We would understand that every one of us is vulnerable when we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Any one of these things is a perfect setup for, uh, for falling to temptation because we're temporarily distracted or distressed. And we need to be careful and, and uh, have some insight into what's going on in our own, in our, in our own heads and hearts. I uh, came across a quote that uh, we have to be careful not to do something permanently stupid because we're temporarily angry, stressed, hungry, or tired. And again, probably uh, halt is not new to a lot of you. Uh, it's, I like it a lot, and uh, I need the constant reminder. And again, when I look back at my life, any time that I've fallen in an area uh, of temptation, I can point it back to one of these things. So, another pointer. Uh, before marriage, we need to understand that long periods alone with unstructured time are going to be a problem, just the way that it is. And that going over to someone's place to watch Netflix is not a real plan for sexual integrity. Right? Again, uh, we need to always uh, be thinking about sexual integrity before marriage, during marriage. After marriage, we need to be proactive in protecting our hearts. I think for men and women, the issues are a little bit different. You know, for men, affairs are often about the sex, and for women, affairs are often about the emotional connection. Different issues that we face as men and women. Even still, though, we need to do everything we can to guard our relationships, and we need to set up boundaries with other people. Uh, some of the things uh, that I've set up in my own personal life, I remember as a student in seminary, and uh, in a one-month period, I heard about five pastors uh, who, uh, 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 who fell in this in area of uh, sexual integrity. It really sc actually scared the living daylights out of me as a ministry student and uh, made me think. Uh, there's, uh, in, in uh, just my own, uh, my, own, uh, my own family, my dad had an affair and he left my mom. You know, you think about these things and uh, you think, I had a great respect for these pastors that I'd heard about when I was in seminary, knew some of them personally, had a great respect for them, I thought, if that can happen to them, who am I? Okay, all this. So, you know, I thought about, uh, thought about some of these things. Maybe uh, some of you are thinking, he just thinks like way too much. But let me see if these things uh, uh, are maybe uh, could be helpful to you. And this is why I bring them up here in, in, uh, in this area of protecting our own hearts. I generally don't touch other women, okay, just so that no one misunderstands my intentions. Uh, I generally don't go anywhere with another woman that I would not normally go. Okay, so part of my work duties, that's one thing, but... Uh, you know, I'm not, not going to go log time uh, with other women uh, in that way. I don't tell other women something I haven't told Jan. I think that's pretty important. You know, that guards the, uh, that guards the intimacy that we have between each other. Uh, again, I don't log time alone with other women. Uh, I don't talk about our relationship issues. Every relationship has issues that couples work through. That's just the way that it is. I don't tell other women the relationship issues that I have with Jan. Again, we want to guard that. I want to guard that. I want to protect Jan in that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, hopefully you see the importance of that. Uh, Jan has full access to my computer and my phone. Okay? Very important. She can look at that any time. And we share some of these things. And... Uh, it's important. And Jan has the right to say, that's it. So, if she detects something from another woman toward me, I mean, let me tell you, I'm pretty numb sometimes when it comes to this stuff, okay? And uh, I just don't pick up on these sort of things. And, uh, you know, not always so very socially aware. Okay, my wife is much more perceptive, and I rely on her. She's only ever had to do this in the 20, in, once in the 25 years that we've been married. But when it happens, I listen to her. Right? She has that right. And uh, I listen to her. When she says, eh, something there. Got to be careful. 
Or uh, if she says, that's it, like you need to, whatever that, you know, that uh, is, you know, that relationship, okay. In another church, she could have said, let the other pastor handle her. And I would have said, that's fine, I understand. So these are some of the things that, uh, that I've used over the years. Put them out there. Uh, hopefully, they're helpful to you. Regarding the computer, okay, big issue. And a lot of people think that uh, there are so many people that think pornography is just a normal part of life that recently Cosmopolitan magazine actually wrote an, uh, an article defending pornography use. Okay? Let me be very clear. Okay, pornography is sexual immorality. That's where you want to be careful to say all the syllables in the word, <laughs> okay? You know, pornography is sexual immorality. We need to be careful with how we use the computer and other media like TV and movies. Now, if this is an issue, then just simply know that time alone with the computer or the TV is going to be a problem. Now, up on the screen, you'll see a screenshot from Covenant Eyes. Uh, Covenant Eyes is, uh, it's it's, uh, you can go to the website, it's a service that's out there. It is hands down the best resource out there for Christians who are either dealing with pornography personally or who are affected by this. Because you have to remember there are both sides of this. There are people who use pornography and it does affect a marriage. Okay? So hands down, this is the best resource for Christians who are dealing with or affected by pornography use. For men or women, users or spouses, there's great tips, there's great advice there on maintaining sexual integrity, there's great advice on supporting someone who's dealing with this. There's a great website, there's protective software, filtering software, and there's a daily letter that you can sign up for. Good stuff. And I put it out there as a resource for helping with this because we can take control. We need to. Now, something else to remember, a little pointer. Yep. Remember this about God's will, okay? Just in case you're confused. God is never, ever going to send you someone else's spouse, okay? Just saying. Okay, let's be clear. A little more humor in what could be a very serious, what is a very serious topic, right? Finally, what do we do if we realize we need a restart on sexual integrity? What do we do? First thing is we repent. We have the promise from 1 John 1, 9. And I memorized this when I was a youngster, and I think it's something that every Christian ought to have memorized. And if we confess our sins, let's say this together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Okay, that's where the restart begins. We confess it to God, we repent. Okay? He gives us forgiveness. It's a restart. We have that opportunity with the Lord. Number two, we need to learn the lessons and avoid a repeat. Okay, it's one thing, uh, one thing to turn to the Lord. It's another thing if we don't actually learn the lessons. So when we fall, we have an opportunity then to... Uh, to go over the experience, not to beat ourselves up, okay, because they, uh, Satan loves to produce in us a false guilt. Okay, once we give that to the Lord, it is gone. Okay, but Satan loves to bring that back. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about chewing it over and over uh, guiltily. I'm talking about learning the lessons. Was I hungry, angry, lonely, tired? What was it that contributed to me falling in that whatever area? And learn the lessons. And then avoid him, Okay. We have that opportunity to learn from all of this. And we need to do that. Thirdly, we have to be extremely careful not to use God's grace as an excuse for sin. You know, uh, just, we, just because we can go to God and ask forgiveness doesn't mean that that's a license. In fact, it, Paul tells us in Romans, Romans 6, 1 and 2, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. Heaven forbid is one, uh, one uh, translation. There. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Again, that's keeping that higher goal in mind. The sanctification, living that holy life. We have a higher purpose than just being towed around by our urges and desires. 
There are perhaps some other things we could add. All this is to say that we can take control. We don't have to be led around by those impulses and desires. So we're wrapping things up. I want to remember three things in this passage that we've been looking at from 1 Thessalonians. So first, of all, first of all, we talked about focusing on the higher goal. That's sanctification. That's the higher goal that God wants for all of his people. Secondly, we need to decide not to sin. And then finally, we've learned that we can take control. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the hope that there is in this passage. Father, that in this world that uh, uh, tries so hard to draw us backward from where we came, Father, we thank you that you were there, encouraging and drawing us close to you, that you want us to draw close to you, to be holy as you are holy. Father, and you give us the strength, the power, and the resources to be able to do it. Father, we pray that in this area of sexual integrity, you would grant strength to each one of us. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. But more than that, we ask your strength that we would always look toward your higher goal of being more and more like you, drawing close to you in every way. And Father, we pray that uh, once again, your strength, in Jesus' name.